Hello, and welcome to this National Family Caregivers Month conference hosted by MS Focus, the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation. I'm your host, Deborah Foreman, the Educational Programs Coordinator for MS Focus, and I'm joined by Sherry and David Binns, who will be talking to us today about what it's like being partners in the pandemic and some coping skills for your care partner and you. Now, I know that to many of you, Sherry Binns is not a stranger, as she's spoken at many of our educational programs, both on land and at sea, and she's written numerous articles for our many publications. But for those that have not had the good fortune to meet or to at least benefit from Sherry's knowledge and warm style, I'm delighted to introduce her and have her share a bit more about herself and her wonderful supportive husband, David. Sherry and David, thank you so much for being with us today, and I'm gonna turn it over to you. Oh, well, thanks, Deb. Um, my journey with MS actually began more than 45 years ago. David and I got married in, the, in June of 1975, oh. and at the end of October that year, I was admitted to the hospital with what we thought was encephalitis. Um, it, it came back after the spinal tap as not being encephalitis, but everything looked like um, symptomatically it was. And we now know that that was probably the first clinical episode that I had that made me really sick. I took me a good three, four months to recover. So here we were newlyweds and had this to deal with. And in the interim, it seemed like every, maybe every couple of years, I'd sort of get laid low with um, symptom clusters that um, we look back now and say, uh-huh, that was MS. So we sort of have had time over the years to adjust to a care partner role. I like to say care partner because very rarely have I needed somebody to give me care, um, but I certainly need a partner sometimes to help with that care. Um, my background is nursing. I was a nurse working in an inner city clinic in Houston, Texas, where David was working in the lab at the time when we met. And um, since, since that time, I've gotten an additional degree in gerontology. I figured that would help me to work smarter and not harder uh, to still keep me employable. Um, in 2003, I became certified as an internationally certified MS nurse. So there are only about 1,200 of us worldwide, um, and we do our best to keep up on what's going on in MS treatment arena and uh, lifestyle changes that have been shown to help and that sort of thing. Um, so I'm gonna let David talk a little bit about caregiving care partnering from his viewpoint and just sit back for a minute and let you listen to him and then we'll sort of have a discussion about these things and if you've got questions as we say something don't hesitate to type it into the chat box because we will get into a dialogue uh, among us as this webinar continues. Um, from 1975 to now is quite a long time. Um, and um, so we've had um, time to adjust to things as they came along. Sherry, I find normally um, wants things to be as normal as possible in that, in that context. Uh, by the same token, she's taken the challenges that MS presents and gone as far and as extreme well, I'll tell you the extent of her type A personality. On, on day two of this COVID, she started making masks and she's up to over a thousand masks. So, I mean, that's part of her personality. And so she's very attentive to, even at that point, even with a medical background, um, listening to every professional out there. Uh, digging up information, 
back when we had books, she was reading out of books. Um, now it's it's all online. It's all tutorials. It's all there's lots of sources there for any questions that come up. You don't necessarily have to save them for the doctor. You can at least do the research at home before you meet with the doctor. Um, there's uh, doctor visits, still certain regimens that she does, um, certain foods that she needs to stay away from. Uh, let's make that just, she's saying, let's just make that part of normal. And let's talk and think and act about other stuff. In other words, carry on our lives as best we can with what limitations are there. We're gonna call those limitations normal. And and continue forward, however we can, and, and push the push the wall a little bit as they as the walls creep in, push push back. Um, if you're a problem solver, and you decide to apply that that skill of coping, um, set to solving the issues related to COVID nineteen in this case, good. Yeah, that's good instincts, uh, read about it, catch educational forums, discuss your questions, thoughts, hopes, and fears about it. Um, normalcy, which we're talking about, does not require ignorance. Uh, it's in both your best interest to learn as much as possible about this threat. I, I sort of jet jettisoned into the COVID issue because that's really what we've been asked to talk about, how COVID relates to uh, caregiving uh, to MS, uh, to dealing with life as it has been changed into most recently, and may be with us for the foreseeable um, next six months, eight months, whatever. Um, we've never experienced anything like this coronavirus. I think everybody taking part in this can say the same thing. Um, well, some of our essential choices have been taken away. Uh, where we eat, where we go out to a show, how we relate to others through masks and social distancing, even how and when and if we go to church, um, our jobs may be cut back and we may have friends or relatives or even family battling uh, everything from COVID to depression to anger. Um, throw in a contentious election and we have the trifecta of enforced lifestyle changes touching on our health, our financial resources, and even our belief system, be it spiritual or secular. Our concerns are, are just our life plans have, have gone up in smoke, it seems. Uh, we're looking at uh, spending holidays away from loved ones except through formats like this. Um, I'm a real estate broker, uh, no longer working in the lab in the, the clinic and restrictions on entering my office or a house, knowing that not everyone was following the rules could put Sherry's health to risk. So I take that very seriously, realizing that I can go out into the world and bring back something which could, because of the medications that she's on, uh, could send her down a spiral, a very fast spiral. So that's one of the considerations is, is just the safety, the concern, not for one's self necessarily, but for those around us and certainly for those that we're caring for. And I, I like the way that Sherry put that, she has not needed a lot of care and she hasn't. Um, it's been a more a matter of uh, companionship than care. Um, We're pretty well matched as a couple. Um, Sherry's type A overachiever, as I, I talked about. I'm not, not even close. Um, that said, sometime earlier this week, Sherry sewed and distributed. We've talked about the, the masks. As a nurse for a talent for, show, for sewing, doing is her way of coping. And that's a phrase I'm going to repeat a couple of times. Doing is a way of coping. I have broken out of my type B status. I was giving myself some credit there with the B. 
and cedar stripped and reshingled my barn, worked with a handyman and renovating a duplex in a four bedroom home at the university. Uh, replaced my shed floor, still sold dozens of properties and patiently received daily briefings word for word about the latest on the coronavirus. I, I could say, well, I'm too busy for that, but the coronavirus is that important. Um, knowing what the rules are out there, uh, giving some faith to the people who really truly know about this uh, is a part of our action, uh, my action to, to protect myself and to protect Sherry and others that, that I run into. Um, and I have been, it's been extremely busy, but at the same time, you, you've got to make time for that. Even if you've got a full-time job as a caregiver, uh, make the time, you know, change your life a little bit for a while. We've got to get through this. As we stepped out of our usual patterns, I found that there's actually more time available to do things of deep importance. Uh, I taught my middle grandson how to sail. I found, you know, and that was sort of a wish dream. It'd be nice if I could take each grandchild and uh, get them out on the boat one-on-one -on -one and sail. And so I realized that, that you realize when you've got important things going on in the household, um, that you want to get to the important things. And um, he's also great company. As a, he's a 13-year-old. He's, he's great help on the chores that I have as well. Um, in the uh, restorations of the house and the duplex, Gregory and I become friends. I know this because his, and you got to wait for this one, because his mom tells me he wondered if my sailboat would end up his when I died. Uh, so now whenever he asks me how I'm doing, that's the kind of question why he's asking. But, um, there were standout moments generally, Sherry continues to know well the inconveniences and painful reality of living with MS. Uh, she's not free of the symptoms, she's coping with the symptoms. Her traveling to give talks have all gone into mastering Zoom. This and mastering may be too strong a word, but certainly we're, we're able to use it um, and other outlets. I would, I would need to say though that coping by doing, whether by tackling some goals, making masks or being more intentional about the precautions gives all of us a stronger sense of not being controlled by the pandemic. Now, some critics would stand out there and say, oh, you're being controlled by the pandemic. You're doing all this weird stuff. You're being ruled by fear. You're being ruled by fear. But learning about something is not being ruled by it. It's just the opposite. It's, it's doing one's best to confront it and being able to then lend a hand outside of yourself. Uh, we wear masks to protect ourselves, but we largely wear masks to protect others because we don't know if we have it until four or five days at the best. Um, it lingers in the air. You know, that, that's what we have to remember. It, it's uh, microscopic, it lingers in the air. Somebody had me, gave me a great est, uh, estimation of that. He said, uh, I was talking about hiking because I like to hike trails. And I said, you know, that's one thing early on I discovered is that you're following somebody else on a trail. And chances are they're going up, they're breathing pretty heavy. Other chances are that they're they're social creatures like I am, and that they've been with other people. I, but I don't know their political bent. I don't know their uh, attitude about mask wearing. And I'm breathing their air, maybe 30 feet behind. And and that the fact that that microscopic organism is in the air. Um, and somebody said, yeah, it's like following somebody smoking. I said, yeah, that's exactly it. It's like, you can, you can smell somebody if they're a hundred feet in front of you who's smoking. Those are particles in the air. 
you have to think of it like that. You, you don't think like, well, let me put my mask on as I've seen people do today because somebody walked into the room. You, you want that mask to absorb anything that you might have. And so in learning about this, we're going to stay safer because it's not a good ride with MS and the complications of COVID. It's like having MS and a heart condition where you can't breathe. It's, and so we've seen so many die uh, and those are real numbers. And so we want to protect each other from that. Um, working with the pro present moment instead of denying it, establishing stronger ties with grandkids and neighbors, fellow parishioners, old friends, an easy opening line with anyone you've neglected. And this is, this is something that I'm doing more of is calling people that I wanted to continue a relationship with and saying, how are you doing? And if it's been too long a time to feel like you're a friend anymore, you just call and say, how are you doing with this COVID thing? Um, and then you get them talking about the COVID and, and you get maybe share something about what you're going through that will help somebody else with COVID. It's the reaching out that gives a lot more meaning to life. And um, do it cautiously. Don't come across like a fanatic like I do sometimes. Just do it as a friend and say, you know, I've heard. <laughs> and uh, you don't want this. You know, you don't want this disease. Um, Dave's been using the phrase coping by doing. Um, as we were talking over this past weekend uh, about getting ready to do this talk, um, my next article for the MS Focus came out and it's on coping mechanisms. We each have coping mechanisms that are unique to us. Um, for me, I tend to go into overdrive doing something, but we've got to be careful about letting the coping mechanisms take over because they may then need to be coped with if they take on our lives um, and, and don't allow us to have the time for the responsibilities that keep the household running smoothly or keep our health running smoothly. If I'm sitting at the sewing machine for hours on end and not taking time to take breaks or to take a walk or to get some exercise, um, I may be derailing myself. So we need to be very, very careful about not giving in. Now, Dave said, alluded also to the fact that because I have MS, he doesn't want to potentially bring something home. People with MS essentially are at no greater risk to get COVID than those that don't have MS. There are some factors though um, that make us more susceptible to COVID. Um, and that is something called comorbidities, um, additional health conditions that we have. Obesity is the number one that uh, affects people, smoking, COPD, emphysema, right up there on top. Those two factors make it more difficult to recover once you've gotten COVID. Um, they make it much more likely that you'll end up on a ventilator or with long-term uh, respiratory problems. Um, High blood pressure is another one. Diabetes is another one. So I'm, I'm sitting here now. Um, I'm, I'm no longer obese, but I'm still very overweight. Um, I was obese for years. And through exercise and changing the way that I eat and work out, um, I've, I've shed some pounds that have gotten me away from that term, which I detest. Um, I also have high blood pressure. I have thyroid disease. I'm diabetic. So I am at risk. 
Plus, I'm on one of the medications. Uh, there's, there's a handful of medications for MS, things like Acrovis, Rituxan, Lemtrada, um, Mavenclad, that actually do suppress our immune systems. We, our immune systems are in overdrive normally. So they're geared to fight infection. Um, but on those four medications, they tend to be suppressed. Anybody that's getting steroids uh, has a suppressed immune system, so they're more likely to contract it. So, you know, I, I think we need to be careful not to talk in specifics about our risk or our lack thereof. We need to be aware that everybody's risk is a little bit different, but there are some commonalities. Um, so if you have any one of those health conditions that I've mentioned, then you need to be more careful than usual. Um, Dave used the analogy of hiking in, in the wake of someone's um, expired respiration. And it's, it's, I'll hearken back to another likelihood back when we were kids back when we were teens or young adults, we were told to be careful who you get in bed with because when you get in bed with somebody, you're getting in bed with everybody they've ever been in bed with. And it's the same sort of thing. If, if you're standing in the grocery aisle talking to somebody and somebody else walks by, even if you're all masked, um, there are particles that can get through a mask. They're, they're, this is such a tiny, tiny particle. So we need to be very careful about making sure that that distancing happens. Um, unmasked, it's not six or 12 feet. It's actually, they're, they're finding droplets unmasked from people as far as 14 or 15 feet away that are still very active. And as the weather's getting cooler, those particles tend to sit in the air longer as long as six hours sometimes in the testing that's been done. So please be very careful. If you're outside of your home, people that do not live in your home should not be coming in unless they're essential services coming in to care for you. No one should be entering your door without a mask on. Um, so, you know, I, I think, I think, there's, there's room for a lot of flexibility here. Um, you know what your routines are, but think about it like, you know, I've, I've lived here for years and I've never locked my doors, but the neighborhood's changing. So, you know, think about who, what is in your neighborhood and how you might need to protect yourself from that. Um, I, I know a lot of families are, are really craving face-to-face -face time. Um, we've seen, we're, we're lucky in that we've seen our grandchildren. A lot of people haven't had a chance to see them or to hold them. We don't hold our grandchildren. We don't hug our grandchildren. And we're always masked when we're in their proximity. And we're always distanced six feet or more, even with the masks on. Um, I encourage you, wherever possible, to do that, um, as Dave said, to, to make sure that you spend time with family, friends, neighbors. Um, I see Philip saying, Sherry, my wife spends a great deal of time on her iPad. These activities, uh, let me click on to the chat. It just clicked off for me. Um, these activities just before bedtime may hinder the ability to sleep well. Also the type of iPad screen light, the frequency of the light wavelength might impact sleep as well. Thoughts? Um, we know that um, the, the light from our cell phones, our laptops, our iPads, our tablets, um, for the most part do disrupt sleep. And it's recommended by sleep specialists that you're offline for at least an hour prior to bedtime. Um, I find that my, most computers now do have a night setting on them. So if you go into the settings on your computer or your iPad and do night setting, 
it changes the light from the blue light to a more yellow light, which is supposed to not interfere as much with sleep. Um, I have my computer set to those, those night settings. So I hope that answers your question, Philip. Um, I, I think at, at this point, perhaps we can sort of unmute people maybe and let them just ask questions if they have questions and maybe we can just get a dialogue going among those of us who are on this call. Deb, can you unmute folks? I'm gonna unmute you, but I believe you have to unmute yourself once I allow you to do that. So I think, I think I'm unmuted. Yep. Am I unmuted? Is, that, is it David? Yeah. I just want to Gary. have a comment. Hi. Hi. Hey. I just want to have a comment and to say that the caregivers and the, the people who are around us is, are really important. I have been living with MS from the age of 14, and this is 23 years later. And so God is good. And so even though we have this COVID, and we don't move around. And yes, I agree with the mask and everything. And I'm home a lot. But these type of forums or or other things of this nature where we're keeping ourselves away from, from this person or the next person, we won't get those droplets. And so I, I, I'm just thankful for the, this, this, this forum. And your husband is doing a great thing. And and yes, it's 23 years for me, and I know it may be longer for others, but we have to keep on fighting. We got to keep on fighting, and we can make it. We can Amen. make it. That's my comment. And so, but this is this is awesome. I and I just love being sitting into meetings like this. It's like it gives me encouragement to know that you know other people have something that or or whatever, and I'm able to just talk with you. You guys, it's, it's just a wonderful time. Thank you, David. Yeah, man. Yes, I'm thanks, David. Um, I, I see that David's really vigilant about um, not putting you at risk. Obviously, by, by doing that, he's not putting himself at risk. Mm -hmm. um, but what, what do people do that have a care partner or a spouse that doesn't feel the same way? How do we, you know, I like my husband goes to work every day, swears that he wears his mask whenever somebody walks into the, into the office, but just told me the other day that his employees refuse to wear masks and they run in and out. And, and I say, you know, that you're bringing it home to me. You have to keep thinking you're bringing it home to me, regardless of whether you show symptoms or not. Um, it's it's hard. I'm sure some of the people here must have people that they love that don't feel the way that David does. Oh, I'm sure there are. Um, you know, a couple or three months ago, they did a poll on mask use, and we were about 47% nationwide. And in order to really knock this down and knock this out, we have to be at the, the guesstimates are at about 95% mask use all the time. Um, that includes not just when people walk into your space. Um, David's office is set up so that uh, you walk into a lobby area and then there are offices with closed doors all around a loop in the building. If people are in their individual office with the door closed, they don't need a mask on. If anybody comes in, they do need a mask. If they're in the halls, they need a mask. If they're in the lobby, they need a mask. And yet I can't tell you how many times I've walked into businesses that are supposed to be operating under these guidelines. And I walk in and there are two people in an office talking to each other, neither of whom have a mask on. But when I come in, they'll both put their masks on. Now, that's not the way we're gonna get this thing under control. We have to wear the mask all the time. I took my car in for servicing on Monday, uh, a week ago, um, yesterday. And um, big, big dealership, nobody on the work floor was wearing a mask. 
and I commented on that and I said, you know, nobody out there is wearing a mask. Oh, but when they get into a customer's car to move the car, they put a mask on and they're all at least six feet away from the next worker. Well, six feet doesn't do it without a mask on. The guys in the office that were checking customers in and out had their masks off unless they were with a customer. They were six to 12 feet away from other workers. We're not gonna get beyond this if people do that. You have to wear a mask the entire time you're in the presence of another individual. This is just gonna keep trickling, keep hanging on, keep being a threat for months and months on end. We may never get rid of COVID, even with the vaccines that are coming out, unless people are smart about this. So. The other aspect to this is it's not just masks. Um, whenever any, I've got a good size office, but um, I have an office mate that comes in just very, very rarely that we're there together. Um, but I'll, it could be 30 degrees outside. I'll crank the window open anyways, um, only just to get that that air circulating. Um, you know, it, it's um, it's just being COVID minded. You know, it, it's it's saying an observant of your environment and and observant too of of how one would how you would feel if you were the cause of somebody a carrier of somebody who then got COVID. Um, and that- or worse yet, died from it. Yeah, or well, just the, the COVID itself is you know, pretty pretty awful, but yeah, certainly if they died. Um, but the other part of it is the way that this is hitting the country, uh, the businesses, you know, the, the struggling um, owners of, of businesses who are, uh, laying people off, the people getting laid off, um, the restaurants that are closing, the, there's, there's a lot at stake. Uh, and it's not a brave thing to not wear a mask. And somehow a, a good portion of the population thinks that that's a, a courageous stand. It, it's, it's nothing less than a, a unthinking, ignorant, selfish stand um, to, to not be wearing a mask, uh, given the information that we've been given. Uh, did I say that clear enough? <laughs> um, another thing, uh, I was talking with a friend. Um, mm -hmm. She's a virtual friend. I, I've known her and worked for her on with her on some committees over the last four or five years. But um, she recently had to be in the hospital for a couple of days. Um, and she said, I couldn't believe it. I had nurses walking into my room. I had to wear a mask, but I had nurses walking into my room without masks on because they said that they'd had COVID so they couldn't catch it. Um, mm. And I, really? I, I just, really? I, I had to pick my jaw up off the floor. Wow. Um, we need to model this behavior. If we've had COVID, we still wear masks when we're around other people. We're not exempt. It just shows that we care. Um, we're, we're not maybe doing it to keep ourselves from getting COVID, but we don't know enough about this virus and how it works yet to know whether or not we could still be carriers after we've recovered, even if we have a negative test. That doesn't mean that we couldn't still give it to somebody. We don't know that. Um, so always assume that if you're not wearing a mask, you are potentially exposing someone, even if you think that you're safe, even if you've been vaccinated, even if you know you don't have antibodies or 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 you do have antibodies. Don't figure, don't keep yourself at the center of this. If if we keep ourselves at the center, we tend to be acting out of privilege. And this isn't what this is about. We're caring. We're not acting out of privilege. This is not the time to exert those rights. A lot of couples are challenged by spending more time together these days and getting on one another's nerves. <laughs> Casey, yeah. 
<laughs> particularly if both are working from home. What advice do you have for coping with constant togetherness? Uh, Dave, Dave has to go out and work in the barn. <laughs> uh, we we have both, you know, we have the benefit of both of us having been self-employed for years and both of us having offices or workspaces here in our home. And, you know, I I, I think David's very uh, aware. He, if he's trying to, to put together a comparative market analysis for a potential um, real estate listing, and I say, oh, I was just uh, on Casey's Facebook page, and she said this. I, just, I don't need to hear this in the middle of my work. Um, I, I, we just need to be aware if somebody's working from home that we need to give them space, and we need to respect that space. And yeah, our, you know, I, I'll, I may holler out, are you ready for a break? Because uh, I've got something to tell you. And I'll write it down because things just go in and out of this head so quickly that if I don't write something down, I, I likely will forget it. But no, we do need to give each other space if we're both working from home. It's tough when you've got children and you got to try to be productive in your work um, with distance. And you know, I, I think um, we the children have to take precedence. We can't be pushing them aside in order to um, in, in order to get our work done. Um, that can have long-lasting, very detrimental results. So again, there's no manual written on this. We have to find our way. We have to be flexible. We have to do some creative problem solving. I'll tell you, I, I have found a, uh, a real uh, advantage to this new COVID lifestyle um, that's worth taking into the next life. Uh, well, not the next life, but you know, <laughs> post COVID. If we ever get post COVID, the next phase of life. Next phase. That, that is um, because I'm able to get out and hike. Uh, I've stopped thinking of uh, having to do this in a certain place and just, you know, there are trails here in Rhode Island uh, where we reside um, all over the place, you know, and, and if you're able to, to hike or if you just want to put yourself on a little bit of a regimen to hike um be intentional i think i think intentionality is is uh not a word that i've always lived by uh haphazard seat of the pants other things like that sort of come to mind uh but this time in my life it just seems like i'm being more intentional about um taking advantage of, of what's out there and um, okay, so it's a little bit too cozy in the house. Um, find an outlet. If you're in a wheelchair, uh, find a friend who, who can uh, take you for a ride or a walk. Or, you know, uh, just be more intentional about getting into fresh air. Um, that's the big thing that. Uh, they're talking about right now is that as the cold weather hits the Northeast, uh, I don't know how many of you are in a cold area, but everybody sort of moves inside. And um, it, there's nothing about uh, colder air or necessarily rain that it should be driving us inside. And that's really counterintuitive. I realize this because you think, well, I'm gonna get a cold, I'll die. Um, <laughs> Maybe, maybe not, you know, and maybe you'll have had a good hike and maybe you'll say, yeah, I got to do this tomorrow. Um, openings, look for openings like that, that uh, say, gee, it's, it looks nice outside. Why don't we go take a walk? You know, uh, why don't we get back into a routine of, of doing it if we can, or just ta tackle it one day at a time. I found that when I was scooter dependent, um, two or three years of scooter dependency a few years ago, um, the, the scooter really gave me the ability to get out and um, get out onto the bike path and just get out in the fresh air. So I would encourage you 
just to be outdoors as much as possible or bring the outdoors in, as Dave mentioned, cranking open the window. Um, when, when we go to church, all of the windows in the church are open. Um, the fans are in the ceiling, everybody's masked. Um, our pastor told us as we get into cold weather, be prepared to um, dress warmly because we're gonna keep the windows open throughout the winter when people are in the building. So, and, and it was 32 when we got up here this morning. So we're headed into, you know, into some good cool weather, which is why we're, we're dressed warmly, flannels. Um, so I just think that, uh, what is geocaching from Susan? I don't know what geocaching is. Can you hear me? I, I didn't I want to interrupt you. Any, but I'd be happy to tell you, especially because you like to hike. Oh, yeah. Does anybody else know about it? No. Nope. Oh, look up geocaching.com. And it's okay. spelled G-E-O-C-A-C-H-I-N-G. Yeah. There are millions of them hidden all over the world. Oh, you can look yes. up on your yeah, look them up on your computer, get the app to your phone, and it runs yep. on your uh, like latitude and longitude, like GPS. Yep. Now you, you, you yeah, I, I, I yeah. know the idea. Yeah. Yeah, we love it. We've been doing it since 2012, and we it is really fun. Um, and you can get out. We bring mm -hmm. our hand sanitizer because who knows who touched it like a day ago right yeah um, but uh i we went to a meet and greet with uh you know several other people years ago yeah. and i remember we were so proud because we found around 500 of them i told that to this one woman and she said and we found about a hundred thousand oh and we just got back from egypt and found one at the pyramids my husband and I like him at the drugstore parking lot. You know, it's like. <laughs> <laughs> so it's wow. a really good way to get out, keep your mind going. Like yeah. That. Yeah. Wow. That's, yeah. that's good to hear. Good to know about. I see that uh, Casey has popped in. A lot of people are dealing with depression. If you think your significant other is getting depressed by the pandemic, what should you do and what should you look for? Um, Good question. We're definitely seeing that more and more. I think irritability is a real, um, it's, it's a precursor to the down and out, just not able to function. If, if somebody in your household is more irritable than usual, um, you can just, it, it's fine to say, you know, you seem a little irritable today. Is everything okay? What can I do for you? Um, just take a moment and be present to that person and listen to their response. Um, certainly overeating, um, undereating, appetite is a, um, a telltale sign if there are changes in appetite, if there's changes in sleeping. Um, are they wanting to sleep all the time? Are they taking two, three naps a day? Are they um, moody? Uh, teary, um, any of those things, and and certainly um, our healthcare system is is on the alert right now that there's so much of that going on. Most of us that are seeing a neurologist, our neurologists are very attuned to this because most of our neurologists are dual certified in both neurology and psychiatry. So if it's necessary to treat a depression. Um, they can treat it with medicines. Um, they also know who to refer people to. And with this, one of the beauties about this COVID environment that we've gotten ourselves into is that telehealth visits are so much more accessible than they ever were. Um, one of my friends is a psychologist and he lives in a very remote part of Maine and he does, his patients are literally all over the country. 
and he does his hour long telehealth sessions with them via uh, a secure um, telehealth visit, similar to Zoom, except it's more secure. So their information can't get out there into places it shouldn't be. Um, so I think, I think don't try to tough it out. If you're feeling depressed, don't tell somebody to get over it or to snap out of it. It's probably the worst thing you could do to anybody who really truly is depressed or getting depressed. Um, people who have never experienced a severe depression don't understand that it's probably more painful than a broken bone. The, the pain of depression is real, it's tangible, it's debilitating, and it's devastating. So before it gets that deep, um, ask those questions. You don't you seem like you're not doing so well today. What's going on? Is there something you need that I can provide? Um, don't be afraid to ask. Are there any other questions from anyone? I do. Casey and David, I, 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 this is not really COVID related, but more of a care partner um, question. And this is regardless of whether your care partner is your spouse or the person you live with or someone that comes to visit you and that's, or a, a medical professional. But I, when, when you don't feel good, Sherry, do you, and it's MS related, do you have to tell David that I don't feel well, this is bothering me, or does he know that? This, you know, there has to be communication because otherwise they, you become resentful that the person doesn't acknowledge that you're not up to your usual. Uh, I just, I don't know how you deal with that. Does he just know you so well? And that's what we're looking for, a care partner to know us well, or is it give and take and each one of you have to tell each other? So. Um, I think it's a mixture. I mean, we've been married for over 45 years. I've had MS for close to 45 years. Um, and, and so when you've got that kind of history, generally you can pick up on the signals, but um, there have been days where he's come in and I'm like the, the typical 1950s, 1960s housewife, the meals on the table and warm when he walks in the house. Um, and, and I'm, um, dressed to please, you know, it's like, I, I'm not in a bathrobe when he comes in. I don't have my hair in curlers. I, I usually have makeup on, you know, I, I try to be presentable, but there are times when he's come in and the meal's not ready and he'll walk in. Are you okay? You okay? Uh, and, um, Deb, Keisha is waiting in the waiting room. Could you let her in please? Thank you. Um, and, and so there are times like that, you know, I, I just, I, I've been in such pain today that I really, mm. I don't know what to get for supper. And, and he'll say, okay, you know, I'll, I'll go rummage and I'll find something and I'll make dinner for us. So I think they're just, and you know, we've used the word flexibility off and on throughout this conversation. I think we just need to be flexible. And if we do have a need, we need to not be bashful about sharing it. Um, I think that as, you know, as we get into the swing of a relationship like that, it's pretty easy to begin to read each other's signs as we know mm -hmm. each other well. So um, no, as a care partner, you're not expected to read minds and know what's going on. As a person with a condition, you can't expect everybody to even pick up on what you're going through because it's just too complex. So target your biggest need and put it out there and say, I'm sorry, but for today, we've had to forego, you know, um, dinner engagements uh, with, with people in the past before COVID um, because I just haven't been up to it. I remember one Thanksgiving where depression was so intense for me that I just couldn't face 
the extended family. And so I begged on a Thanksgiving dinner. Um, if it's that bad, be sure and make that known. <clears throat> But also be safe about it. And if you're cooking a turkey for the first time, they put giblets in a bag inside the turkey. You need to know that because we, neither my daughter nor I figured that one out. Uh, I, I had just gotten home from the hospital from having surgery um, <clears throat> on Thanksgiving morning. I'm, I'm sleeping under the influence of pain medicine. And Dave said, Dave came in and woke me up and he said, um, Honey, you know the, the giblets that usually come with a turkey? My mom always made giblet gravy, but I can't find any giblets. And I said, they're inside the turkey. And it had been in the oven for an hour, so he had to go fish them out. <laughs> so. Yeah, I think, I think a lot of what our expectations of our care partner, if we don't, as you say, tell them what our expectations are, then we become resentful that they just don't automatically know whether they've known us for 40 years or not. But we, we have to. I mean, I went through breast cancer, as you know. I went through um, chemo and not feeling well. And I was always angry at my husband for not understanding that this is the way I feel. But I wasn't forthcoming in telling him what was going on and how I felt and what I, I didn't want him to make me fruit because I couldn't get it down my throat. He thought he was doing a great job making me fruit. So I think that we need to tell them, again, whether it's your mother or your spouse or whoever, what makes you happy? What kind of expectations you have of them as a care partner? I think then, then you have less resentment on both sides. Yeah, um, we're not mind readers, but we ex what we're feeling is so intense to us. It's so all encompassing that we don't know how somebody this close to us can't hear, see, feel, understand it. So uh, we, need to, we need to realize that David can't feel that my hip is screaming at me. You know, he can't feel it. He can't see it in me because I've learned to, ad to adapt to that so that whatever's going on, um, I wear masks well. I mean, uh, uh, not just the kind that we put on. Um, Philip brings up a point that uh, it, it, that we certainly can share the responsibility of food prep and that home delivery is essential. I've been using a home delivery grocery service now for about 15 years. Um, there is very little more overwhelming to me than going into a supermarket and weaving up and down the aisles and lifting things in and out of the cart and then bagging and taking the bags out to the car and coming home at. If I do that, I'm done for a couple of days. So I, I feel very grateful that we have these um, food delivery services available. Um, and he mentions Home Chef. Home Chef is a, uh, a company that basically will send you a meal in a box with instructions on how to put it together. And for some people, it's a, it's a wonderful journey into learning how to cook that they've never, they've never tried before. They've never really learned how to cook correctly. And, and I've, I've heard people have uh, sort of taken off and, and gotten busy as, as a creative cook as a result of something like this. Um, that's one thing that COVID has done for me is that I've found that I cre I cook far more creatively than I used to, and um, I even when I'm I'm preparing my gluten free meals, I've found ways to um, really jazz up the food so that it it tastes absolutely delightful. Um, served David a meal the other night that that looked like a, um, I took a gluten-free spiral pasta and I sauteed peppers and onions and a little bit of spinach and chard together with it and uh, a little cayenne pepper. I love cayenne pepper now. I never really used to use it. Uh, 
and I sauteed a, a pound of Beyond Beef and mixed it all up with some tomato sauce and baked it with a little cheese on top. And it was phenomenal. It was good. I mean, it, was, it was fake meat, but it was good. Yeah. <laughs> I like fake meat. Yeah. I like fake meat. Wonderful. Does well, we've, got, we've got both Deb and Casey on the line, at least, that don't eat meat, so. Yeah. I love Beyond Meat. Mm -mm -mm. I do. Hey, we had a we had a party. I don't remember what we were celebrating. It was I don't know what we were doing at work, but everybody else was able to eat whatever we had. And I think I brought in burgers and we cooked them, didn't we? The I brought in Beyond Meat burgers for the few vegetarians that there were. And uh, it might have even been the first time for some of them that ate it. It was really yummy. Oh. Anyway. Yeah, we haven't uh, ordered from restaurants uh, much, um, but I did discover one thing. If you use the services that are out there that popped up on the internet, um, the restaurants kind of have to establish relationships with those if they want to get the food out of their like kitchen. Uber Eats. Uh, Uber like Eats. Uh, there's four or five of them, actually. Um, they take a good 15 to 20 percent of the uh, the profit. Um, I we're in a small town. We have maybe within a five minute drive, we have maybe 15 restaurants. I want to see them survive this. Um, we're yeah. in an area, a beach area, where um, there's already a seasonal sort of thing going on. Um, I want to see them come through next spring. So I'm not utilizing those services. I just call the restaurant and ask to speak to whoever can take an order. Um, and then drive up for a contactless yeah. delivery. You you pick it up, put your car window down, they'll set it on the on the seat of the car and you're off. So, you know, I, I it's a good point things like Uber Eat and um, those types of apps, they really, our daughter's an Uber driver. And I think if she's driving a total of 15 or 20 minutes to go pick up somebody's food delivery and drop it at their house, um, she may get a dollar, dollar and a half from Uber for doing that delivery because Uber takes so much of the, of the money for that. So, you know, keep those things in mind too when you're you're figuring out how to survive this different way of living. Um, and and uh, and think about, you know, extending yourself a little bit to if if you're able to go and pick something up like that with a contactless delivery. Our grocery stores now are allowing us to call in an order. They prepare the order and you can pick it up at curbside at no co no delivery cost. Um, just just pay for your grocery order. You don't need to tip or anything like that. So um, support your local businesses in that way. Or two individuals who are out there, um, wait staff, um, uh, people who it's natural to tip, tip and tip generously because they're, their hours are cut back. Um, they've gone maybe three or five weeks without uh, without work. Uh, they're they're struggling through this. Uh, sometimes it it helps to take one's eyes off their own struggling to get better. Yeah. And and that it it uh, um, and do that because we're you know maybe we're getting checks where we're getting other sources of income. Uh, we're generally doing pretty well under this. I see we're at the top of the hour, so um, I don't want to keep you all into the next hour. Thank you for your attentiveness. Um, and, and this will be up online uh, within a week or two on our... I'm going to tell everybody what's coming up and all that, okay. but if you have anything else you can finish and then I'll go on. Are you all done? All set. Okay. No, we're good. <laughs> 
So if you've missed any part of this conference, um, I know some of you came in late. If you have an interest to see the beginning part, which was really great, uh, you can replay it on msfocusradio.org once it goes up and available. Also, it'll be on demand and it'll be on our MS Focus SoundCloud page or even YouTube page once that goes up. But I think it takes probably about three weeks, I think, Casey, right, to go up? Two weeks? Okay. Um, remember to follow us on MS Focus uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram for times and access information. Our next teleconference, and once again, in honor of National Family Caregivers Month, I do like Care Partner better, but that's what it's called. <laughs> it will be this coming Monday, November 30th at 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time, featuring Zachary White, PhD, and um, his partner, Donna Thompson. They will be discussing when caregiving meets love, rethinking personal and family support. And his is really, truly designed for care partners. Um, and we welcome all of you to join as um, our clients and as MS patients, but the care partners, whoever they are, would really benefit by his, um, by his program. Our sincere thanks to all of our attendees for your participation and especially to Sherry and Dave. Uh, thank you so much for the time that it took for you to put this all together and attend today. And uh, for everybody else, this information also was awesome. Thank you very much. But uh, we would like to thank everybody for attending and stay well. And we hope to see you next time. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very Bye. much. Bye now.